So a huge thank you to our corporate partners as per usual, which is uh, Solera Autotex, BASF, BMS, CAPS, Copart, Emax, Integral, Enterprise Ventacar, Innovation Group, Merca, Nationwide Vehicle Recovery Assistance, SEG Response and Sherwin-Williams, as well as our partners Aztec, driven by Repairify, the Green Parts Specialists in Darsa and Prasco UK. A couple of events coming up that you should probably all be aware of, hopefully by now, the MGA, so Managing General Agents uh, Conference uh, is next week, 28th of September. Tickets are still available, a huge part of the market, which is probably uh, unknown but uh, well worth a look in there. And we've also got our exclusive motor claims conference coming up on the 6th of October, so soon thereafter. Again, tickets and sponsorship packages available for that too. So technology, that's what it's all about today. And joining us, we have Claire Hart, National Sales Manager of Integral. We've got Jim Loughran, CEO of E2E, and we've got Dave Shepard, Director of Shepard Advisory Services. So the disclaimer, uh, the views and opinions expressed during the following webinar are those of the individual contributors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the contributor's employer, organisation committee or other group or individual. Please respect any all contributions and we encourage you to join the conversation via the interactive functions available. So there we go. That was easy for you guys. So welcome along. Uh, Claire, how are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Yes, very well. Thank you. Fabulous. And you're uh, at uh, Integral HQ today. Bit of building work going on at home, apparently. So uh, <laughs> it's the best place yeah, to be. For some peace and quiet. Good stuff. And Jim, how is the world treating you? Yeah, good. Thank you. I have a bit of a head cold. So apologies if uh, if you see me blowing my nose during this. But uh, at least it's not COVID. We will forgive you for that, good sir. We certainly will. And and Dave, what about yourself? Yeah, all good in my world. Thank you, uh, Mark. And uh, looking forward to today's event. Fabulous. Right, let's kickstart things and let's get everyone involved. So um, very basic little uh, poll to kickstart things. So let's launch it. Let's see what the opinions are. Um, so how important is advancing the technology capabilities within your business right now? High, moderate, low. There you go. Three simple categories for you. Um, Dave, I'm going to come to you first while we leave that poll running. So how important is technology in the motor claims sector right now? I think it's been important for a while, but I think the importance is actually growing right now for, for very many reasons, really. You know, we have parts supply issues which means, if you like, can we get the parts, can we get the vehicle in on time? So how do we match the parts availability with the vehicle coming on site at the right time for anything that's actually mobile? I think that's an area, and I think that's something we might like to discuss a little bit more today. You've also got the different build, um, I suppose, complexities, really. You know, we were used to dealing with, the build of the structure, you know, high strength steels, aluminiums, all of that. ADAS, we started to get our heads around ADAS, you know, is the shop qualified? Do we have competent people that can actually work on that? And now, of course, we've got, you know, an increasing amount of battery or EV um, hybrids coming in. And again, people need to understand and have the capability of repairing those. So I think technology, at the front end, FNOL, helping people triage by vehicle type, vehicle build is critical so that the repair shop knows what's coming into their shop and when. A multitude of factors, I would suggest. And uh, Jim, playing straight into your hands there, Dave kind of kicked off with the, with the parts element. Um, you know, similar question to you, but, uh, you know. Yeah, clearly, clearly the use of... Uh, of reclaimed parts is something we're very involved in. Uh, it's something that G2E have driven over many years. Uh, I would say it's becoming more and more uh, a driver of technological need as well, because 
although there's plenty of inventory of parts out there, you need to know where they are. You need to know what they are and are they the right, the right part for your car. So there's a huge amount of data that needs to be exchanged in those engagements. That's still, I think, a challenge which, which awaits a perfect solution yet. Uh, it's, uh, my, my observation there is there are certainly elements and point solutions out there for certain elements of it, but uh, nothing that leads an end-to-end -end fully integrated uh, supply chain solution. I think from what, uh, from what David said, I'd agree with certainly the, the part supply chain is a big driver, but also claims inflation. Everything that we do is costing us time and money. Uh, and everything that the insurers and the handlers and the processing, it needs to be more efficient. We've got to drive that efficiency through automation and through technology. And I know Claire will have uh, a fair amount to say on this as well. Uh, ADAS and autonomous vehicles, battery EVs, all of that technology is coming into our business these days. And we need to be able to handle it. Not only that, it's going to drive the need for much more data. Data becomes much more important when regarding the repair processes for these automated ADAS systems and for the auto autonomous vehicles. The FNOL point that David raised, the digital journey, that's where it begins. Well, that's where it should begin with the, uh, the first notification of loss and where we take the customer journey from there. It should be seamless. We need to get to a point where it is. We've got some way to go on that journey. And it's not just about the technology. It's about the processes all the way through the supply chain, from insurer, from claims handler, through salvage, through repair, through body shops. We need to be more joined up. Well, you've teed us up very nicely there for some uh, some further questions. But um, Claire, I'll come across to you. I mean, you're kind of you know seeing this firsthand in terms of the customers that you're speaking with nationally. Um, you know, where is kind of you know technology within the heart of the industry right now? Yeah, I think the key to what Dave and Jim have both said is you know it's all about connectivity and how can we make sure that everybody has access to everything. Um, and they're not having to log into different portals to get this update, to get that update. You know, it's all about, as they've both just alluded to, you know, parts and um, recovery agents. How does everybody speak to one another so that everybody's getting the right information so that we can make that claim more efficient, more cost effective and in essence quicker? Um, and that's the key to it, really. You know, today, I think we have a lot of disjointed parts to the repair a lot of it's manual um and people need to be able to access all of that information and they need to be able to access it immediately you know so anything from the fnol you know how quickly can we get the fnol down to the shop how quickly can we get it out to the recovery agent can that all go through one system or certainly one system that will speak to everything um and we need to start getting towards that so that the body shops actually benefit from all of that technology that's out there. Fabulous, right, let's just come back to all of this. So share the results of the poll. The good news is um, that uh, technology is, is high on the agenda for 90%, for moderate for 10%. So nobody's forgotten about it. And uh, it's uh, it's bubbling away there for everybody right now. So um, we talk process. And during a recent claims tech interview, um, I've kind of been involved in, in those, and that spans across all sides of the, our business, home and uh, and motor. Um, and there's sort of talk, you know, in terms of technology is only good, as good as the process or the user, if you like. Now, what would your thoughts be on that? Dave, I'll come to you first, if I may. Yeah, of course. You know, if you've got poor processes, you know, automating it doesn't change anything, you know. Um, yeah, I remember in the early days, you know, we were all trying to recreate paper documents on screen. Yeah? And there's an element, I think, of that still. And I think it's very difficult because the industry has kind of grown over time. So things get hardwired in, you know, the way we handle a customer, the way we talk to the customer. We tend to 
treat the customer, certainly at Ethnol, really, there's a little bit of empathy. Of course, there is. I'm not saying there isn't. But from then on, we want to give them a vanilla service where actually that's not always required. So, again, I think if you could have the process where you can actually take the information and listen to the information or the requirement of the customer early on in the process, because then that process should change whether I want, do I need a courtesy car? Do I want another form of mobility or actually am I okay because of my wife's got a car, we can share that for the duration of the repair. But also as that process goes on and my repair, you know, maybe there's a part that is not available for a few extra days I might need a replacement car for a couple of days or some other form of mobility. At the moment, that seems very, very hard to actually deliver to the end user. And I think sometimes our processes are designed to help us, either the insurance industry or the repair industry, and we forget about the customer at the end. So, you know, ideal world, clean sheet of paper, how would we redesign that flow? And I think there's some of that that needs to happen as we go through these challenging times. And I thought we started that in COVID. We started to get more digital. We started to ask the customer what they wanted. I think there's a little bit now of we've gone back to telling them what they need. Very interesting indeed. And and Claire, I'll I'll sort of jump across to you now because you you guys are sort of developing these systems um, and we've seen various elements to what you're doing over previous events and things so you know following on from what dave said is that very much you know at the heart of everything that you guys are doing um and is it that sort of process piece that actually links everything together ultimately yeah i think you know you you've got to sort of look back just bouncing off dave's comment there you know with the customer i think everybody's got so busy again now that it kind of becomes, they become far down the chain again. It's like, you know, like you were saying, when one of my parts coming in, et cetera. And something that we've always said is, you know, if you're not putting the data into that system until we can get to a, a point where AI is, it knows everything, which we're never going to reach that point. You know, there will always be a human element to the data that's being transferred. So how do we make sure that the shops, the claim centers, the insurers all know what data to put in to make sure that it's one version of the truth and not skipping those corners every time. And, and that, you know, we're all human. People cut corners to try and save a little bit of time and, and get that job out the door as quickly as possible. But without that data transferring and without those updates going up, it fundamentally comes back to the customer not receiving the journey that they want to receive. Um, you know, is my car ready? Well, if, if somebody's not putting that into a system and updating it correctly, the insurer doesn't know, the customer doesn't know, ultimately. So, you know, I, it is only as good as the person that's putting the information in there today. How do we help with that going forward? Well, we need to make it easier. You know, we need to make that almost instantaneous for that technician in the workshop, that person on the front desk. How can they get that data into that system quickly and easily? For instance, Siri, you know, just we need to start thinking outside of the box that while they're really busy and they're in the workshops, how can they still get that information back to the relevant people that need it? That's great. That's great. Siri in the workshop. Wow. Um, but uh, but no, I mean, super exciting stuff. And as Dave says, you know, it's, it's really interesting coming out of you know, the COVID period, and we're not harping back onto that, but, you know, we were all kind of very agile as individuals, as businesses, and I know we were sat this side of the fence doing lots of things, and and you do kind of get back into that normality kind of state where you think things are going back to where they once were, and, and, and you know, they're, they're kind of not in a sense. And, and Jim, from your side, I mean, specifically from from, if you like, the the salvage, the recycling side of things, but also with your background in in sort of, you know, IT. Um, Again, do you see the need for change within the industry to uh, mobilise more technology or or is it kind of driven the other way, if you like? Does technology mobilise the industry, so to speak? I I would caution on jumping to technology solutions without understanding the problem fully. And I think it's what David said, and Claire also uh, mentioned it as well. We need to understand the flows 
that happen, uh, we need to understand what data we need to collect. Data can be very tempting. We can end up collecting a huge amount of it, but until we actually analyze it, it doesn't become useful information. And it's information, and those words, information technology or IT, those, there's both of those words that are important, not just the technology word. Business is about making decisions, and the service we provide is about making the correct decisions at the appropriate time and doing that as speedily as possible. The companies and the operations that can do that most efficiently are the ones that will win, are the ones that will operate more effectively, they will operate with better returns. And the manner to do that is to understand those processes, to put the people in the right places to drive that, to drive the data flows, and then to accept and evolve the convergence of technology into that. An example that came to, to my mind a couple of days ago was one of the new Apple announcements. The new Apple iPhone has a decelerometer within it that can contact emergency services if the vehicle it's in has, has a crash, if it decelerates too quickly. It immediately polls emergency services. It seems clear to me that that's the sort of technology we should be embracing for ethanol, electronic ethanol. And that's just the beginning of that digital journey. Interesting thoughts. And that leads us on again. You've teed this up for me, Jim, I know, but um, into the next question. But in the meantime, let's launch the second poll. So operational. And again, very kind of simple, basic breakdown. So with regard to available technology, what do you feel would benefit your business the most? Does it need to be easy to use, better support, greater integration, something we've already touched upon, process enhancement, again, the subject matter we've just been talking about, or is it more intelligent systems that we're all kind of you know hankering after and that we think are going to solve everything? So jumping back to where we've just been, Jim, and your sort of closing comment about the, uh, the Apple iPhone 14, and that's not an advert. Other phones are available. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but great piece of technology. Um, are there kind of, and I'll use the term quick wins. There's never a quick win, because if there were, we would all be doing it and all in the same place. But are there quick wins when it comes to technology that, that can benefit the industry? I.e. adoption of something like that, an out, outside source. Um, and are there simple ways to optimise what we've currently got? Are we using things to their optimum level? Can we win a bit quicker with certain th ways and things to do? I, I, I think uh, yeah. my approach is to look at both. There are quick wins out there. There are things that we can take off the shelf and uh, enable the use within our processes to move the data along more accurately and quicker. Uh, but in many ways, that will only move the bottleneck. And unless we look at the overall holistic uh, delivery flow, and that's the flow of data and the flow of information and the decision-making processes and the communication with the customer, how do we update the communication flow to the customer rather than save the customer phoning in and needing somebody to answer those phones or respond to those emails? We've got to look at it holistically from end to end. Okay. And, and Claire, from, from your side, I mean, users of your various systems that come under the integral umbrella, but are there ways to optimise usage for the time being? And, and kind of to put some context, I suppose when we talk about technology, everyone thinks wholesale change, huge investment, ah, it's scary, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, etc. I always think, you know, in the meantime, can there be advancements made in terms of how they utilise technology for, for the time being, if you like? Yeah, I think there absolutely is. I mean, I was just thinking back then when Jim said about quick wins, you know, I think certainly during COVID, image capture became a really quick win. 
um, you know, using an external source and there are multiple available, but that linked into your system or within your body shop that you could get that information in as quickly as possible, but without having to have contact with the customer and without having to have the vehicle on site. And I think it's something that's really continued even to now. You know, there's people now estimating off the back of these image systems, and I think that will only progress. So there's definitely quick wins in that way in that it allows the body shop to take time out. They've not got the customer sat in front of them and they've not got the vehicle sat in front of them. They can take that time. They can assess the vehicle. And I think about 90% of the time, and again, well, please, nobody count me on that, but yeah. they, you know, they're getting a really good estimate from it. They're going to know pretty much what they're going to need to do to that vehicle, which then allows that body shop or repair centre to get ahead. Um, and I think that's where the quick wins are, you know, in terms of using the technology that they have to hand, it's looking at the technology that's available to them and are they actually using it or are they trying to cheat it, so to speak, and use it to their advantage? And a lot of the time it does sometimes take them to sit back and go, right, actually, I didn't even know this was available to me, but if I use that today, you know, it's going to help me with my parts ordering or it's going to help me get this fit, you know, keep my customer informed as to when I actually need that vehicle on site. So I can then narrow it down to a 24-hour period rather than it being, or even a two-hour period, rather than it being, will be there at some point, um, which then obviously just has a knock-on effect for everybody. You know, anybody that works in that way, you're leading yourself to to extending that repair length and extending that customer journey all the time. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I often think, you know, things like uh, our, mobile, our mobile phones, for example, I probably use it to 20% of its sort of capabilities, if that, you know, and it's having the time and inclination, I suppose, to kind of stretch those boundaries and actually use it for what it really could be used for. Um, let's just have a little look at the results from the operational poll. So uh, the majority greater integration where we started, uh, Dave, with yourself, process enhancement um, and then better support. So uh, some interesting thoughts there. So, Dave, I'll come to you. Um, so, again, you know, feel free to kind of touch on the previous as well. But and I said about wholesale change when it comes to technology, but how do you get from that point where you've kind of optimized what you currently have and then take that next step in terms of when does that tipping point come and how do I how do you test technology? Um, you know, without taking the full-fledged, you know, plunge in, so, so, yeah. so to speak. I mean, it's very difficult. You know, because as you said, you know, people do sometimes think I have to change everything. Sometimes you do. But that first thing is to understand, you know, if you understand your current workflows and you can look at that and say, I can see the bottleneck, you know, there's no point me preparing 10 cars a day when I've only got one spray booth and I can only paint six. Or there's no point me painting six cars a day and I've only got one guy that can do the refit. These things really are available today. Most of the body shop management systems have some form of panel, but we tend not to use it. You know, and I speak as an ex, <laughs> ex body shop owner and manager because I was far better walking around the shop making those decisions. Really? Can I really remember all of those vehicles and all of those processes? So again, there's an education that how do we use the system? And I think that came up there better support that's not help me when it's gone wrong it's help me understand how i can use it to motivate or to improve the efficiency in the shop and you know i've worked with many shops over the years and sometimes when they change management system the same thing applies they want to do the same thing they did with their old system kind of why are you changing them because if you looked at the functions and the uh, the benefits that you could get by using some of those features in that new system, you could greatly, if you like, reduce the touch points in that claim. And, you know, Claire mentioned it earlier, you know, the, the people that sit on the front desk in the body shops, it is amazing, even today, how many times they have to get up and walk into the workshop to find the workshop controller or the manager to get a vehicle update, you know? That should all be in the system, but it comes back to that point. Have the technicians got 
tablets that they can work on, swipe on, that will automatically update the system. Can you rely on that? You know, and I was in a shop very recently where they were using T cards. Yeah. And I kind of laughed about it. You know, I think we got rid of those over 20 years ago in the shop. And they said, but we can see it. Yeah. yeah. So I took a T card being of that kind of frame and I put my book on it. And then we spoke about the cars in the workshop. Of course, that car got forgotten because they couldn't see the T card. But also, if you were a, an insurer, a customer that was kind of connected to that shop, you can't see those T cards on the wall behind the person that's in reception. So again, it's that education to start to think about, you know, get rid of that safety net of a handwritten T card and having to move, move it along every day in the slots. Use the technology. So again, some of that is education. Integration is a great area of, it's a bugbear of mine, yeah? There's some really sexy software out there. If only it could talk to the next piece in the chain because then I don't have a break point. I don't have to enter another portal or log on to another system to make that happen. So, and in today's world, you know, open platforms, microservices, API first design of products, there's no reason why people can't plug in to other people's platforms, if you like. I mean, nobody really has a platform anymore, but. There's no reason why you can't plug into that workflow. And, and I think this is where the industry could do something fairly quickly. It's understanding how do we write that little interface between system A and system B. And at the end of the day, that user or the end customer, they're all our customers. You know, whether that's a customer of Claire's or it's a customer of Jim's, we're connected in that supply chain. So, that integration, I think, is one of the key areas for improvement. And I think that could be done fairly quickly. It won't be perfect, you know. And I think that's another thing. You know, we shouldn't build, we should aim for perfect software, but sometimes, you know, release it so that it adds a benefit now. It's like image capture. When image capture was first launched in COVID, it was a bit clunky. But you know what? People used it. People learned from it. The systems were improved over time. So, Again, sometimes, you know, you need that event to actually make that change. Something has to compel you to make that change. Interesting. The whole kind of getting started uh, mentality, isn't it? Um, to, get, to get started on something rather than worry yeah. about perfection in the first instance. But, Jim, I know you've got uh, some thoughts on all of this, and that's uh, a, a sort of uh, an area that's close to close to your heart, this kind of integration, um, especially with, I suppose, you know, where you, where you sit within the industry. I think we have to keep the user in, in mind at all times. Um, and the illustration that David has just shared with us, thank you for that, David. It's a, it's a really good example of where fear of change, lack of familiarity, uh, difficulty of use, Clearly, the T-card was easier to use than the system which had been designed to replace it. There may be uh, there may be other issues around that, but there used to be a process, uh, a business process called business process re-engineering, BPR, back in the day where people would spend an awful lot of time looking at how processes happen within business and see how we can redesign them. There's less time spent in that now, much more time it seems developing point solutions, and David referred to microservices, and the connectivity between those solutions is a hell of a lot easier. Uh, and, and that holds some of the secrets for the future, because the past has been one that's led us to a position of many organizations becoming application constrained by implementing vast solutions uh, that, that then are very difficult to evolve, to change, to manage, and they've invested a lot of time and effort into those solutions. So on the one side, we have the threat of becoming application constrained. On the other side, we have the point solutions that need to be connected together to represent the data flow. 
The truth like lies to, somewhere in between. Yeah. Sorry, Jim. I'd just like to cut in there as well because I think I think Claire mentioned this uh, as part of you know her conversation that sometimes those pieces of software are designed for one user or one segment of the industry without thinking about that flow. And I think you're absolutely right that far too few people actually map out the flow and then say, how can we use technology to improve that? And I also see people, <laughs> frighteningly, I see people designing software without working the flow out as well. <laughs> Great yeah. UI. Yeah. Great yeah. UI, but hey, it doesn't connect. <laughs> yeah, it used to be... I think that's it, Dave. I think Sorry, you, Claire, you know, you, the industry has got to get together to connect. And if yeah. we can make it possible for them to plug into any management system or any claim system or wherever they need to plug into so that everybody is getting access to that information. You know, we talk about image capture. There's what, five, six, seven providers out there today, yeah. Yeah. but they none of them integrate or one insurers asking them to use one but then another insurer is asking them to use another you know how do we make this the body shop just wants to repair the car as quickly as possible and it wants to make as much money out of it as possible the insurer wants to have that claim through as quickly as possible and to keep that customer so how do we how do we let everybody get access that if you know if an accident repair center turns around and goes right well i need access to x y and z absolutely no problem there you go do 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 and, and you're all set up for it and it's not going to be easy, but I think the industry needs to work towards that. Yeah. And, and I, 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 the one point I wanted to make, and I, I, I'm sure Claire won't want to hear this, but I believe that that design process should become technology agnostic. Absolutely. And that, and, and that then opens, opens the playing field to a much more level position where the best solution at the time will get, will get sold, plugged in, and it will work. And when it becomes outdated, it'll be unplugged and the next one's plugged in. The body shop doesn't have to decide which version, which protocol to invest in. It can stay in an open systems, open architecture environment and constantly, and you avoid that investment in the wrong application, becoming application constrained, being then tied down by what you've done in the past. I know shops that have more than one management system because yeah, they have yeah, to exactly. use more than one management system, which is just, you know, absolute absurdity, really, yeah. um, especially now. All right. Fantastic conversation. And uh, Neil Parr Davis has dropped a, a sort of comment or, or question in uh, as a software developer, which is um, uh, hindered in the UK by lack of a single standard such as uh, a seeker in the US. Is there a place for a single open source standard for exchange and repair claims information in this country? Who should lead that effort? Well, uh, again, what we've kind of been discussing there, and I'm not sure we'll get the answer today, but uh, interesting food for thought and ties in with uh, with the discussions taking place um we'll launch another poll just to kind of keep the conversation ticking along so uh, improvements what one area do you think could most benefit from advanced technology in motor claims at the moment kind of flies in the face in terms of what we've been discussing about that integration and uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, kind of solutions but breaking it down is there one area where we think actually you know that would uh, specifically benefit at this moment in time. Um, Claire, I'll come to you uh, for, for some comments on this. And so, you know, where do you sort of feel the greatest advances in technology could be made in the sector and, and why? Is it this connectivity that's, that's the real key to everything? I think so. I think it's, you know, the, the, the repair centres or whoever they are being able to order parts timely, you know, no more phone calls, no more emails, just one click of a button. They know the availability, they know the delivery date, you know, that whole connectivity, when's my recovery truck coming? When can I get out to my customer and how can I let that customer know within a two hour time window that I'm coming? You know, the more that we can connect to, the more technology that we can connect to, the more information and the more scope that body shop has in terms of, in, you know, reducing that repair length and, and, and increasing that customer journey. Um, you know, it is, it, it's key. And certainly, as Dave mentioned earlier, you know, parts is a, is a, is a very big area that um, 
I personally hear a lot about, you know, when I'm out and about and how clunky it is and how difficult it is. And, you know, being able to label those parts even and know more about they are in your workshop down to, you know, down to the nitty gritty of it. The more connectivity and the more process we can put in place for those shops, you know, it's just going to make it so much easier. Fabulous stuff. Right. We'll just have a little look at the poll. Uh potentially reinforces what, what we've kind of been saying. Supply chain processes comes out to tops where most improvements could be made. 65% uh, assessment stroke triage, 22% and ethanol in there with that 9% with a with a third party resolution as well at 4%. Um, Dave, any more thoughts on what we would say there in terms of the greatest advancements in technology, where, where can they be made in the sector? Again, does it come back to what you were talking about in terms of parts from the, you know, right at the outset? Yeah, I think parts is a, is a big issue. And I think it's been brought home, you know, because of the economic crisis we've had, the supply chain issues, you know, we've got with China, Ukraine, Russia, all of that is uh, putting a focus right now on parts. And, you know, you would think in today's world that I know the rules of my work provider. They're put into my system. I've created my estimate, imported it into my body shop management system, and I'm going to hit a button. Now, that button will take off and it says, okay, the first thing I'm going to look at is recycled. What can I get that's recycled? Okay, then I know what I need to go for from OEM and depending on the rules with the insurer, is it OEM next or non-OEM? And as a body shop, I probably deal with one or two providers for each brand. So my local guy hasn't got it. I don't know if somebody 30 or 40 miles away has got it, which was to Jim's earlier point. So once my local guy says, yeah, I've got four of these 10 items, why not then broadcast the remaining piece to a wider network? Because the body shop, I don't really care where I get them from, providing I can get them in a timely fashion yeah. and I've got a reasonable margin. Yeah. And again, sometimes we're constrained as an industry because of a rule that was applied 15 years ago around Mr. Insurer needing or wanting a parts discount. Those rules are changing as the OEMs start to change from franchise dealer networks to agencies yeah. and from centralizing their parts distribution they also need to make you know tremendous changes in their supply chain if you think about a part leaving a factory gate and then getting down to a repair shop it's horrendous how many people handle that and everybody needs a little bit of profit on that journey yeah. so again yeah. with technology and you know we use the term artificial intelligence with our fingers crossed but could we not predict where we're likely to need those parts at certain times of the year? Interesting. That's not a quick fix, but... <laughs> You've given yeah. us a whole new theme for another webinar. Thanks for that, Dave. <laughs> Music to your ears, Jim. I'm sure when Dave said you hit that button and it pings off to the uh, recycled parts uh, initially, your thoughts on, on, on that? Well, I, I think Dave's absolutely right. A number of things he said there, uh, very good. The other point I'd add is that at the moment, the flow of process through from ethanol through to repair or ethanol through to end of life vehicle is, uh, is a single flow. It's a linear flow. And there's no opportunity to revisit the decisions in that flow when the parts availability changes, when you have decided a car is not repairable because the parts aren't available within time scale and therefore mobility costs would actually put the repair costs over there. But now you've found a reclaimed part. Can you redrive that decision? How do we make that usage and penetration of reclaimed parts uh, more, more, how should I say, more adaptable? to what the insurer's processes need, more palatable. Because it's not only is it, could it be incredibly valuable for, the, for that process? Could it be incredib incredibly valuable for those individual vehicles that are becoming end of life too early? 
but it's going to be incredibly valuable for our planet. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, absolutely key and core of uh, lots of uh, philosophy as we move forward, that's for sure. Claire, um, I suppose, again, moving the conversation on specific technologies, what do we think? Or, you know, you're pioneering this in integral in terms of, you know, the, the, the development you're undertaking, but what's kind of going to impact most uh on our particular sector in the coming years, technology-wise, do you think? I don't think you can narrow it down to just one area, unfortunately. Um, I think, you know, as we probably the theme across here all of today is, you know, working together, picking the best bits of technology, um, trying not to overcomplicate that technology as well, I think, going forward. You know, it does what it needs to do. It it has the result it needs to have. But I think, you know, really just connecting and giving everybody that choice, you know, giving that choice back to the repair centres is, is key so that they can make the right decisions and they can pick the right technology for their shop. You know, you can't pigeonhole one shop into one technology stream it, it, you know everybody does things slightly differently um, and they need to pick and choose what works what works for them so sorry if that was a bit broad but I don't think we can really pinpoint it was a horrible question don't worry I, I expected <laughs> just as much back um Jim looking further afield and again with your experience in kind of other other parts of the world other parts of industry um what can we learn from other sectors we're very UK centric. Technology can change that at the flick of a switch. We've got a much broader, much wider marketplace that's open to us. And OK, the steering wheels may be on the other side. But apart from that, there's an awful lot of the same problems that we can, we can resolve by sharing those inventories of car parts and recycled and reclaimed entities. We should think broader. We should think more globally. Very interesting. And and Dave, I suppose closing, parting words from you. Um, you know, break down the industry into its component parts, which is kind of you know part of the the conversation we're having. But we have got some great technology. You know, within our industry, there is no two ways about it. The joining up of this technology seems to be be the key. Um, and, you know, your thoughts in terms of does that happen? How long does something like this take? Is it even possible? Um, you know, what would your kind of overriding thoughts be there? Some of it is possible. Some of it is difficult because, as in any fairly mature industry, there's a lot of legacy. Yeah, so there's a lot of legacy systems. They're very difficult to connect to. And because of technology development in the you know back in time um things were hard coded yeah. which means i can't unpick it that easily and i can't plug something else in because i'm not quite sure what will happen downstream so we have to understand that but it doesn't stop us putting an integration layer across and you know i will mention caps here because yeah i remember you know back in the day when caps was being created and it was all around creating a common interface very similar to what they've got in the US with Seeker. That was its idea. And fundamentally, it can do that. But again, it's about understanding the rest of the journey and saying, okay, how can we use what we've already got? So we have caps. Can we feed into that? And instead of it going one way, can I actually go a different way and go to my parts provider? Theoretically, there's no reason why that can't be done. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And just to uh, a couple more questions have come in. Um, when you say insurers have got issues with claims, this is with the payment side of things or just the whole process, which affects the full process flow. I can't remember quite where we that was comment was made, but um, I, I think in fairness, go on, go on. Sorry, Dave. I think there's two things there. I think claims at the moment are causing insurers pain <laughs> for several reasons. One is the cycle time of a claim, not to do with the key to key when it's in the repair shop, but ordering parts, waiting for them to come in, getting the car in, going out, cycle time 50 to 60 days. That's horrendous for an insurer because they've reserved for it and they can't release any of the reserves until they've paid. 
That's number one. The second part of that is they've got a customer that they've got to manage now for that, those amounts of days. And, you know, insurer world, they call it failure demand. So they've got, I'm, I'm exaggerating, they've got 10 people in the call center. Now they need 20 people because everybody's phoning in, where's my claim? Where's, when's my car going to get repaired? That's causing the insurers a massive issue. Then you've got, of course, claims inflation, which is just the fact that cars are becoming more complex. So therefore, there are more components required to repair that vehicle, and they all come at a cost. So I think they're the three key things insurers, that's keeping insurers awake right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one other comment uh, which mentions CAPS. So uh, it's an anonymous one, but um, yeah, I would mention contact CAPS, go direct to CAPS, ask the questions there in terms of uh, a data, etc. cetera. Um, Kev Thompson, I know you're on the call as well. So uh, be good to kickstart those conversations. Well, there we go. 45 minutes. It's a whistle-stop tour. Um, I'm sure we could go on forever, but really, really fascinating insights into where we're at, people's thoughts, train of thought in terms of technology within the industry. Um, you know, we haven't got all the answers, but uh, doing these kind of conversations kickstarts the thought process and hopefully sparks more debate as we go. So um, thank you very much indeed. Everyone joining us, please do drop some comments in the chat. Let these guys know what you thought and or any more queries, questions. Huge thank you to Claire, Jim and Dave for joining us today. Really, really great insight from everybody. And of course, uh, we go back to a huge thank you from our corporate partners, Solera Auditex, BASF, BMS, CAPS, Copart, Emacs, Integral, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Innovation Group, Merca, Nationwide Vehicle Recovery Assistance, s and Response, and Sherwin-Williams, as well as our partners, Aztec, Driven by Repairify, the Green Part Specialists in DASA and Presco UK. Thank you all so much, everybody. Have yourself. A fantastic rest of your Wednesday. We'll catch up with you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very Bye. much.